Okay, in the last lecture segment, we were talking about the Hox genes as being important for setting up the body, what we call the body plan in the animal kingdom. And there are actually several traits, derived traits, that have to do with the body plan that are going to be important in um, defining the branches of the evolutionary tree in the animal kingdom. And I've introduced the evolutionary tree for the animal kingdom in the last lecture segment, but the first one is body symmetry. So we'll be defining that and discussing what that means, and that's really the first split, the first branch point in the animal kingdom is those animals that have symmetry and those who don't. The second split point will be tissues, and we'll define what tissues are, and then split off um, based on that. And then the third point is going to be type of body cavity. So we'll define that and explain how that affects the different clades. And then patterns of development. So there's certain patterns of development that go, um, that are involved. So these are kind of in order the way they appear um, earliest being symmetry and then moving forward patterns of development. So um, we'll be defining each one of these and and then explaining what the different options are in the animal kingdom. Okay, so the first one is symmetry. Sponges, you'll remember, are classified, um, they're really the only members of the clade called the parazoa, which are in the phylum periphera. And as a group, they are considered to have no symmetry. They are asymmetrical, although there are some specific sponges that do have a kind of symmetry. As a group, there is no rule for symmetry. And so we say that they are, as a group, asymmetrical. And that's just what was agreed upon. Now, the other group, the other branch, are the eumetazoa. And all the eumetazoans have symmetry. And so there's really two types of symmetry that the eumetazoans have. One is called radial symmetry. Radial symmetry is the symmetry of a bicycle wheel or a pizza. So there's a central point. It's a circular organization where there's a central point and you can cut the organism in half in virtually an infinite number of cuts and still get create two equal mirror image halves. Radial symmetry is actually fairly rare in the animal kingdom, but there are definitely some um, clades that have it. The other and much more common symmetry is called bilateral symmetry, and that's the symmetry that, that we have. And the bilateral symmetry, it means that the body has a distinct left and right side that are fundamentally mirror images. But there's only one way to cut the animal in half to get those two mirror image sides. So we call that the mid-sagittal plane would be the cut that would be defining the two, the right and the left sides of the animal. So here you have some pictures of different animals that have different kinds of symmetry. A, it, these are sponges, so this is considered asymmetrical. So in picture A, you're seeing the yellow sponges are asymmetrical. In B and C, you are seeing animals that have radial symmetry. So the sea jelly and the sea anemone have a radial symmetry, so if you're looking at the animal, for example, on the sea anemone, if you're looking from above, you're looking straight down, and the mouth would be in the very center, the tentacles would surround the mouth all the way around, then you can see that there is a radial symmetry, like a, a bicycle wheel or a pizza. The butterfly is an example of bilaterally symmetrical, uh, a 
bilaterally symmetrical animal because there's only one way you could cut that animal to get two equal mirror image halves. So this is a human, and humans are actually kind of a little interesting in the way that um, that we use some of the language to talk about them. But anyway, I'll, I'm going to use this picture. Um, and the only thing we're looking at at this point is that what we call the mid-sagittal plane. So the mid-sagittal plane is the one that is shown right in the middle here. And it, it would cut through from front to back. It would slice through the individual um, going from really, really going from the top of the head down to what we call the vent. It would be a slice through in that way. And then you would get one half of the animal. It would be the left half and one half would be the other half would be the right half. So that mid-sagittal plane is the one that divides the bilaterally symmetrical animal into two mirror image halves. There are some other ways, some other what we call planes that cut through, and these are like imaginary cuts. The transverse plane would cut, I guess, at the waist, you could say, straight across. The coronal plane would separate the front of the animal um, what we usually consider ventral from the back, the dorsal. So, but the, the one that's the most important right now is this mid, what's called the mid-sagittal plane. That's the one that divides the body of a bilaterally symmetrical animal into the two mirror image halves. Okay, evolution of tissues. Tissues are defined as groups of cells of the same type working together. In the Morula embryo, there are no tissues. In the Blastula embryo, there are no tissues. Only in the Gastrula embryo do you first have tissues, and we called those the germ layers. They're the first two true tissues of the animal. So the um, Parazoa, which are the sponges, those uh, animals do not have true tissues, and therefore they also don't have organs. And the thing about the parazoa, the thing about the sponges, is that the embryos, once they get to the morula developmental stage, they never proceed to the blastula stage. In other words, the morula cell, the cells just keep dividing and dividing and eventually just form the sponge. You never have the blastula that has that hollow interior with a sponge embryo. You never have a gastrula. So sponges don't proceed through all those stages. And since they never get to the gastrula stage, then they cannot be considered to have true tissues. And this is a little reminiscent of, you'll recall that the, the uh, bryophytes, like the moss and the liverwort, they didn't have true roots or true stems or true leaves because the definition of root stems and leaves includes having vascular tissue. So the fact that sponges don't have true tissues goes back to that kind of technicality where the definition of tissue is that the embryo in animals, the embryo has to go through a gastrula stage. And so any animal who doesn't go into the gastrula stage cannot technically have tissues. And sponges are really interesting in another way. They can, the cells that make up the sponge can, you can actually dissolve a sponge, you can dissolve the spicules that hold the sponge together and separate all the cells. And if you do that in like an aquarium tank, they will actually re come back together and, and secrete more spicules and rebuild and recreate the animal. So we say that they have the ability to disaggregate and aggregate their cells. Um, and, even more interesting, 
the cells are not terminally differentiated in a sponge. So the amoebocytes and the um, um, coanocytes, for example, can become, you know, you can have an amoebocyte that can turn into or can change into a coanocyte. So they can convert from one type to another, which is really odd. And, and these are actually a lot of these things is why the parazoa are the parazoa. They are a, a, a branch, um, a branch that branches off of the, the rest of the animal kingdom very early in evolution because, and you can see because of these strange characteristics, why they're, they're somewhat separate. The eumetazoa, though, has more or less, this is, there are some exceptions, but the cells become irreversibly differentiated. That means that once a cell becomes a certain type, it stays that type. I know there are some exceptions to that, but for the most part, cells become irreversibly differentiated, and the eumetazoans all have true tissues because the embryos go through gastrulation. Now, in the eumetazoa, the animals that have true tissue, the embryo goes into gastrulation, and those are the first two tissues of any embryo in the animal kingdom. And the first tissues of the embryo are always, 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 the ectoderm and the endoderm. Ectoderm and endoderm. So you can see in this picture, this is a very simplistic drawing where the endoderm is the innermost layer, the ectoderm is the outer surface layer. And then at this point you have some animals that's all they get, that's all they ever have. And so in between them there is what we call a non-living layer or a, what's sometimes called the mesoglia. But for other animals there are there is a third tissue type that forms between the endoderm and the ectoderm which is called the mesoderm. So that, based on whether or not the animal forms a mesoderm, a third tissue layer, we classify the animals into groups. The group with the two layers, endoderm and ectoderm only, are called diploblasts. Animals that form all three germ layers are called triploblasts. Now the body cavity, the body cavity forms only in the triploblast group. So only on the branch that is triploblastic, you will have some animals that will form a body cavity and it is a space within the mesoderm. So you can see at the very bottom of the slide, I have defined body cavity, a space surrounded by mesoderm tissue that forms during development. So an empty space. In fact, you have several cavities in your body. Um, you have the digestive cavity, but that's not your body cavity. Your, when we say body cavity, we're particularly referring to one that is surrounded by mesoderm. Your digestive cavity is another cavity, and that is the you know, when you eat something, it is the entire path that the food would go from mouth all the way to anus. So all of that is your digestive cavity. But the body cavity is separate from that. It's, the, it's what you would have to cut through the skin, cut through the ribs to get into like where your heart is, where your lungs are, that's your body cavity. Or in your abdominal space, there's, an up, there's part of that cavity there too. So you'd have to cut into the body to get to the body cavity. So, and I mentioned in the last slide, all of the animals that have a body cavity are bilateral, which mean, and they're also triploblastic. So bilateral animals are all triploblastic. That means they have endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm. And then you should start to memorize what endoderm eventually forms into, what ectoderm eventually forms into. So that's what I've listed here, ectoderm forms the body covering like skin and the nervous system, all the neurons in the brain for animals that have a brain. 
not all animals have a brain. But mesoderm, mesoderm becomes a lot of things. I wrote skeleton and muscles here, but I should have also included bone and blood. If I was making a really quick list, bone and blood would be also in mesoderm. And then endoderm is di the digest all the digestive organs, including intestines. So these are the three germ layers in the embryo, and these, and then in parentheses, this is what a, a very quick list of what those tissues eventually form into. So the correct term for the body cavity is the coelom, C-O-E-L-O-M. I know it looks like you would pronounce it colum, but that's not how it's pronounced. It's a... Um, the, the, uh, the first O, I guess, is silent. Let's put it that way. So coelom. Now, all of the animals that have three germ layers, three tissue layers, um, have the possibility of having the coelom, the body cavity. However, just to make things a little confusing, there are a few animals that don't have a coelom, but they do have three tissue layers. So triple blasts that have no coelom are called acelomate. And that is listed here on letter A, acelomate. And there's a little diagram of what that would look like. And so again, you have the, um, they're showing the blue layer is the ectoderm, the green layer is mesoderm, the red layer is endoderm. So you can see all three colors, but no body cavity. Now there is a digestive cavity, but the digestive cavity is not the same thing as the coelom. The coelom is, like I was saying before, in the human, that would be where your heart and your lungs, for example, would be. So they don't have that. They, they do have a digestive cavity, but that's not the what's considered the body cavity. Now, the eucelomates and the pseudocelomates, you can see them over here on B and C. They also have a digestive cavity, but the body cavity is shown in, I don't know, is this yellow or kind of a tan color? So if the body cavity is completely surrounded by green, which is mesoderm, then that's considered a true coelom. So we call them eucelomates. And most animals are eucelomates. If they have a body cavity, but it is surrounded on one side by mesoderm, but on the other side by endoderm in the red, then we call that a pseudocelum, and those animals are called pseudocelomates. So you have the acelomates, the eucelomates, and the pseudocelomates. So the way I usually explain this is if you are a tiny little individual and you could stand inside the coelom, if you're in a eucelomate animal, when you look up and down and all around you, all you would see on all sides would be mesoderm. That's a true coelom. If you were a tiny little man standing in a pseudo coelom, a space here on, on picture number C, then you would look up and I guess if you were standing right down here, you would look up and to the side and you might see some endoderm and you would also look down and to your left and see some mesoderm. So if you would be able to see both endoderm and mesoderm, then you would know that you're in a pseudocelum. It's one way to think about it. Now, I'm not saying one's better than the other. It's not about that. It's just different um, structures. So based on the difference in the structure of the coelom, or in the absence of the coelom, we classify these animals into these groups. All right, and then the last segment here um, is called the evolution of different patterns of development. I'm going to end this lecture segment so that it doesn't get too long, and we'll start with this on the next lecture segment.